Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on ABC 50 Now Live. I'm Isabella Colello. It's a warm October day in the North Country, but how long will the high fall temperatures last? Let's get our latest seven-day forecast from Storm Team meteorologist John D. Pasquale. Hello, Watertown North Country. Happy Wednesday. Let's take a look at our forecast for today. Temperatures approach 70. Some sun at times, especially this morning. Clouds tend to increase as we go through the day. It is breezy too, and that breeze will make it feel a little cooler, but still a nice day. Enjoy. Tonight, we got a few showers possible, especially later at night. Uh, mild. Look at that. Within a few degrees of 60, it's about as mild, if not a little bit milder, where we should be for daytime highs this time of year. Yeah, I know. Summer night. Waking up tomorrow morning, we got some rain moving on in. So I have the umbrella. You're probably not going to have the umbrella handy because it's going to be kind of windy. I'd say the rain jacket you'll want to have tomorrow. All right. Uh, temperature still mild, not quite as mild as today, but still low and mid 60s, falling into the 50s during the afternoon. Maybe even a better thunder shower with some heavier rain moving through on our Thursday during the day. Friday, we got sunshine returning, cooler, but still not bad. Seasonable mid to upper 50s. Uh, looks good right now for much of the weekend. An arrest has been made following an investigation into a Malone homicide. 39-year-old Joshua, Joshua Donays of Owl's Head is accused of the stabbing death of Donald Raymond in the village of Malone, according to an investigation by New York State Police. Police say they responded to the call in the vicinity of 215 Elm Street on the night of October 6th. Police say Denise was arrested after being pulled over during a traffic stop. He was also charged with second-degree murder and remanded to Franklin County Jail without bail. Baldwinsville Superintendent Jason Thompson has been placed on administrative leave after he was arrested last Friday. The decision was made after several hours in an executive session during the Baldwinsville Board of Education special meeting on Monday. News Channel 9's Madison Moore was at the meeting to cover in the announcement regarding the superintendent's future. Deputy Superintendent Joseph DeBarbery will take jo Thompson's place while the board and police continue their investigation. Thompson was arrested on October 7th, accused of driving with a drunk driving with a blood alcohol level of nearly twice the legal limit. The arrest was made shortly after Thompson was seen crowd surfing through the student section of the district's homecoming varsity football game on Friday. Police say he admitted during the arrest and after a field sobriety test that he had one beer at a local restaurant, and they say that while being processed at the police station, he responded to a question regarding how much he drank by replying, too much. According to police, students at the football game spoke with school officials after seeing Thompson's actions and, he, and said he smelled of alcohol. The Baldwinsville police chief said he is proud of the students who came forward and said something. Mountain Peak is underway at Fort Drum, but one aviation unit is conducting its own training, and I got a front row view. Here's more. Every year, active duty soldiers go through qualification training for their weapons. This looks different for each branch, but for the 10th Mountain Division's 110 Attack Aviation Battalion, their weapon system, AH-64 Apaches. Shooting 30mm rounds, rockets, and hellfires, according to the gunnery officer in charge, training happens day and night. Anytime we get to actually get in, use live munitions is great practice for everyone and keeps us ready. For both the battalion's newest pilots and most experienced. Almost every year we have new pilots that come in as their first gunnery with a unit. It can be challenging for them at times, but running through multiple tables and having experienced pilots and instructor pilots in the backseat to help them run through it is uh, it's a world of help to them and it's a great learning experience. With only two pilot crews per aircraft, it truly boils down to teamwork capabilities, starting from the planning period until the Apaches touch back down on the ground. Our morale and teamwork definitely goes up quite a bit during this. It's uh, one of the rare times we could see during gunnery where a whole unit really comes together and you know some people are on days and some people are on nights and there's a time when you get to really see everyone and it really comes together as like developing as an entire unit rather than uh, individuals. 
Micron's announcement to build a computer chip manufacturing facility at White Pine Commerce Park in the town of Clay came in early October, bringing excitement to local colleges, including Clarkson University, which is known for its engineering programs. Clarkson University has a special relationship with the semiconductor industry as its Center for Advanced Materials and Processing Research Department invented a polishing process for chip wafers, which is taught to students and is now used by chip manufacturers around the globe, including Micron. With a promised 45,000 new jobs coming to Central New York with Micron's facility, Clarkson Dean of Engineering William Jemison said that opportunities will also be created for Clarkson students studying in other programs. We're educating the workforce for many different industries. One of the reasons they came to New York was the number of outstanding educational colleges and universities in the region. and We're, we're certainly one of them, so we look forward to working with them to provide what they need to be successful. Micron Technology is hopeful that construction on the facility will begin as early as 2024 and phase one of the project is expected to be complete by the end of the decade. Before we hear from Delaney Kepner about the seventh annual Making a Mark on Canine Cancer Dog Walk, let's take a look at upcoming local events with this week's Community Bulletin Board. The annual Making a Mark on Canine Cancer Dog Walk will be held on Saturday, October 15th at Thompson Park in Watertown. All proceeds go to Paws for Potter and the National Canine Cancer Foundation. The North Country Draft Horse Club will host a fall poll on Sunday, October 16th at the Copenhagen Fire Hall. Weigh-ins at 11 a.m. and the poll begins at noon. A dinner to benefit the Northern Coral Society will be held on Wednesday, October 19th at the Clipper Inn in Clayton. For takeout or dine-in, call 315-686-3844. The Ogdensburg Public Library celebrates their 100th anniversary from October 15th through the 21st. Do you have an event you'd like to share with the community? Share it with us. Submit your event by going to our website, informny.com, then click on Community, then Community Events, and explain the event. ABC 50 will then share your event with the North Country community. Know a student in Jefferson, Lewis, or St. Lawrence County making a difference in their community? Tell us about them and they may be recognized as one of NNY's next generation. One student will be recognized each month and will be given the chance to win a $1,000 award next year. Each monthly finalist will be highlighted online and on television. All 12 finalists will be featured in a one-hour special on ABC 50 and the North Country CW next year. For more information or to submit your nomination, go to informNNY.com. Delaney Kepner here with Kyle Stevenson from the Paws for Potter organization, and you are the founder and president of the organization. So first off, thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, no problem at all. And um, I wanted to start off, there's a lot of passion behind this organization and a story behind the inspiration. So if you wanted to share with us and our audience a little bit about that. Oh, sure. Um, so I... I'm a local veterinarian um, here in Watertown, and I um, lost my best buddy, Potter, um, who was my dog, um, to cancer back in 2015. And it was a very sudden, a sudden uh, situation that happened. Um, he developed a heart-based cancer that was probably there for a while, but I didn't really see a lot of symptoms and it was really a struggle being a veterinarian and a dog mom and not seeing uh, signs that happened. So um, when I lost him two weeks later after his diagnosis, I was in a lot of grief and um, what helped me come out of that was trying to form some sort of organization or some sort of walk or something that um, would help to memorialize him, but also give back to the community for some education. For sure, and I think a lot of people can relate to you in that fact, and losing a pet, there's really no words to go with it, and it's so devastating. And so how awesome that you turn that into something positive that could help other people. And on that point, um, Paws for Potter, it does offer a lot of tools to help detect that, and mm -hmm. if you wanna just touch on what the organization's goals are, or mission, and what you yeah. guys do. Yeah, so um, our mission is actually um, to help educate the general public um, about early cancer detection, early warning signs, um, 
that there is hope for treatment, um, trying to disp dispense myth dispel myths uh, about treatment options um, and helping uh, people kind of find their way through the whole process and then providing some support also. Um, when, when I lost my dog, like I just felt very alone and trying to find like support with other people that were going through the same thing. For, so. sure. For sure, and that helps so much, like I said. You know, when you lose your best friend and your pet who's been there, and I know you guys kind of focus on, you know, your pet is so happy to be with you and every day of their life counts and you're there to make it yeah. special. So it's important to take care of them and know those signs. Yeah. And so on that note, you guys are hosting the seventh annual, correct? Yes. Uh, yeah. mar making a mark on canine cancer dog walk on yeah. Saturday. Uh, so what does that event entail and what's it all about? Uh, yeah, so... Um, like you said, it's the seventh time we're doing this. I still can't believe it's been seven years. Um, so we have um, a couple of uh, dog walking routes for dogs that can't go too far and then dogs that can go a little bit farther. So we have a three quarter mile walk and a two mile walk. Um, we have vendors and crafters coming to support us um, and they have uh, merchandise to sell. Um, we've got um, a Halloween costume contest. We have lots of uh, freebies and goodies and, and um, a lot of information for people uh, to learn more about pet cancer. Um, and the majority of the money that we raise actually goes to the National Canine Cancer Foundation. Awesome. And this is taking place in Thompson Park, yeah, the pavilion, yep, correct? Yep, the little, the, the tiny pavilion, yes. <laughs> and what time does everything start slash take place? Yeah, um, it starts at 10 a.m. Um, our Halloween costume contest is around 1045 so that do dogs don't have to walk in their costume the whole time. Um, and we have different uh, things going on throughout the day for everybody. So, And it goes until 2 well, it sounds like you guys have really thought of everything. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good time. We, we have a good time every year, and we have like a memorial wall so people can put up pictures of their pets and things like that, so it, it'll be good. Awesome. And where can people find more information, sign up to attend? Oh, sh sure. Yeah. Um, so we do have an online pre-registration. If you want to do that, you can go to our website, pauseforpotter.com, um, or you can just show up on Saturday. Um, we have a registration table. Cool. And if someone can't make the walk on Saturday, I know you guys on that website, you can also donate anytime to support yeah. your cause. Yep. Yep. It's, it, there's a donation button right on our website. Yep. Perfect. Anything else our audience needs to know about Saturday or about Paws for Potter organization? Um, as far as the dog walk goes, you don't have to have a dog to come. The only the only thing that we want you to do is love dogs if you come, so it's, it's fine. And how can you not? Yep. I know. <laughs> Well, your passion and your thoughtfulness for the organization and uh, your experience and turning it into something positive really shines through. So thank you, thank you for being here, Kyle. Thank you so much for having no me. No problem. Appreciate we it. appreciate you coming. And we'll send it back to Izzy at the desk for some more local news. The date for Watertown's Christmas Parade and Tree Lighting Ceremony has been set for Friday, December 2nd. And this year, the parade will follow a new route. Beginning at 6 p.m., Watertown Mayor Jeff Smith and members of City Council will kick off the holiday season with a countdown to the lighting of the Christmas tree in front of City Hall. Following the tree lighting, the Christmas parade will start from Washington and Winslow Streets, traveling down Washington Street to Stone Street, and officials say the new route will allow visitors to enjoy the parade from both sides of Washington Street. This year's parade theme will be Christmas in Garland City, and participants can register for the parade on the City of Watertown website. Candy throwing has been banned by officials. Controversy surrounding the proposed Customs and Border Protection Facility in Blind Bay has community members concerned once again, following an announcement last month by Customs and Border Protection confirming the agency's plans to move forward in assessing the site for a 48,000 square foot Border Patrol facility. The facility would be equipped with modernized technology on the shores of the St. Lawrence River to support the already existing facility located on Wellesley Island, based on information from CBB. The Customs and Border P Patrol originally released its draft environmental assessment and finding no significant impact report earlier this year, but received pushback from community members and environmental organizations as Blind Bay is considered a sanctuary by wildlife experts. 
During the review period earlier this year, CPB said it received more than 1,000 comments on the initial draft, which local organizations say they believe are all comments in opposition. The Thousand Islands Land Trust says the land is home to various marsh birds, amphibians, and 50 different species of fish, including the muscalunch. I mean, you have secretive marsh birds, you have amphibians, you have um, over 50 different species of fish um, that utilize this area, including the iconic muskie. Save the River says the project could destroy entire ecosystems. And just what we see out here, they'd have to dredge another four plus feet. It would, it would really wipe out everything Blind Bay has grown to become. The Thousand Islands Land Trust currently owns over 700 feet of undeveloped waterfront in Blind Bay. Tilt is also in the process of acquiring the remainder of the undeveloped waterfront to conserve the bay, but Tilt Executive Director Jake Tibbles believes it wouldn't stop CBB from using the site. An imminent domain would give all control of the bay to CBB. The agency confirmed in a press release that it will conduct additional environmental surveys and evaluate alternate sites. The results will be documented in a draft supplemental environmental assessment that is expected to be available next year. The daughter of a fallen Fort Drum soldier is working to support Gold Star families across the country. Here's a look at her story. Supporting families of soldiers who made the ultimate sacrifice, a mission led by 22-year-old Joelle Leake, whose life changed forever at the age of 15 when her father, Staff Sergeant Bryce Leake, an active duty Army infantryman, was killed during a mission in New Jersey. At that age, it's a very uncertain time, thinking about um, if you're going to college, where you're going to college. And then the grief added on top of that just made things much more complicated for me. His sudden death bringing many uncertainties to Joelle and her two brothers. My father was the provider for our family, and that gave my mom the opportunity to stay home with us kids. Now that he was gone, of course, there were concerns about you know, would my mom be able to be as present? Although the Leak family received tremendous support from both veterans benefits and outside organizations, there was still a gap when it came to financing the children's education. This is where the organization Children of Fallen Patriots stepped in. So Children of Fallen Patriots honors the sacrifices of those fallen heroes by supporting the academic success of their children. Since 2002, um, Children of Fallen Patriots has provided almost $60 million in support. The leaks included in this number. Now coming full circle, Joelle graduated from college last spring and now works full time for the organization, making it her everyday goal to give back to Gold Star families. There was a point in my life where my dad was deployed every other year for a year. We didn't ask for that. We didn't sign up for that, but we were there supporting, you know, our person. And now that they're gone, we need that community to step in and support us. I'm really proud to be a part of this mission. The New York Army National Guard has exceeded its yearly recruiting goal for the 2022 fiscal year, according to the New York State Division of Military and Naval Affairs. The National Guard Bureau gave New York a goal of recruiting 1,175 soldiers for the fiscal year, which ended on September 30th. New York's National Guard finished the year at 103 percent to the recruiting goal, enlisting 1,210 soldiers. The Guard also gained 159 new officers, exceeding its goal by 21. The organization said that New York's Guard was the only Army Guard to meet its recruiting goal for the federal fiscal year. Since 2020, the New York National Guard has deployed over 7,000 troops to assist in the state's COVID-19 response. Almost 20,000 soldiers have been deployed to the Horn of Africa for security duties, Kuwait for support efforts to missions across the Middle East, and Europe to train Ukrainian soldiers. Each month, we are giving our viewers a chance to win books from the North Country Library System. Delaney Kepner went to the Phoenix Public Library to get a sneak peek at this month's book. Delaney Kepner here with Natalie, and we're going to get lit at the Phoenix Public Library. Natalie, tell us a little bit about your book pick. I chose The Bromance Book Club by Alyssa K. Adams. It's a romance novel about a divorced couple that are trying to save their marriage and the husband ends up attending a romance book club, which is a book club of men reading romance novels. And I have in my hands Pete the Cat, who is a story about Pete the Cat, who goes on an adventure and gets his shoes a little dirty along the way, but doesn't stop walking. 
Something, Natalie, I love about the Phoenix Public Library is how involved you guys are in the community. We are. Uh, one of our closest connections is the local school. The whole kindergarten comes over every year in the fall to read a story, make a craft, and get their library card. And how important for kids to create that passion for learning and reading right off the bat. You can enter to win either of these books as part of the NNY Get Lit Book Giveaway on InformNNY.com. I'm sorry, the correct number of soldiers deployed to the across seas for the National Guard was 2,000, not 20,000 soldiers. You can find a way to enter to win the book giveaway on our website and on the ABC 50 mobile app. While you're here, you can also subscribe to our daily newsletter for local news delivered right to your inbox every morning. And you can continue to stay up to date by tuning into News Channel 9 on ABC 50 for a full hour of news, weather, and sports every weekday at 5.30 p.m. Thank you for watching ABC 50 Now Live. I'm Isabella Colello, and we'll see you again next week.